We choose to go to the moon in this decade and do the other things, not because they are easy, but because they are hard. Okay, Houston, we've had a problem here. This is Houston, say again, please. Uh, Houston, we've had a problem. Welcome back to this co-video edition of Space Junk Podcast. I am joined, joined live from Northampton by the fabulous Dr. Thomas Cheney, who very recently achieved doctorhood. Thomas, it is so nice to be here chatting to you. Um, how are you? How's it going? Well, thank you. I'm, I'm good. Um, you know, getting a bit claustrophobic already uh, trapped in the house, but otherwise uh, good. And it's always, always excellent to be able to talk space law with people. Uh, so I'm excited. Yes, it is good. Um, both Thomas and I had hoped to be in Vienna this week, but as it is, here we are meeting via Skype because unfortunately Zoom was down. So hopefully the quality is okay. We'll see. Um, but Thomas, for the benefit of those who are not acquainted with you, what is it that you do? Uh, so uh, it can always be a bit of a challenge because I think space law doesn't quite cover it. Um, so we, sort of space law and policy is to broaden out everything. Um, but my new job title is actually lecturer in space governance uh, at the Open University uh, within their astrobiology uh, OU research group, um, which only some, I say recently, I think it's about six months ago now, uh, secured um, a, I can't quite remember the amount, but something like 8.7 million, might even be 9 million pounds worth of Research England uh, funding to explore the question of uh, are we alone in the universe? Um, and most of the team are scientists uh, actually looking for life in the universe. Um, but as a law and policy person, uh, I'm focused on sort of the, the ins and outs of the Outer Space Treaty and the relevant space governance mechanisms, such as the planetary protection principles, uh, to make sure that you know the scientific environment remains available to them uh, to actually do stuff. Um, right. and it's, it's fantastic. Dream job. <laughs> I was going to say, how is it being one sort of um, policy and law and governance person within a sea of scientists? I, in, in many ways, it's fantastic because if I have an answer about well, how does this work, or uh, you know, like you know, some of these uh, questions are predicated, you know, rely on a scientific understanding in order to have an answer for them, and I can go and speak to an actual scientist. Or I'm reading a paper and I go, I, this doesn't make any sense to me. And I can have someone else to explain it to me. Um, but in other ways, it's interesting the cultural differences between sort of a, a humanities focused uh, academic and the scientist academics in, in the way we approach uh, different problems. And even even the way we operate in terms of like writing papers, um, I've, I've had to explain that uh, having 16 co-authors is not normal for, for a lawyer. Uh <laughs> yeah. <laughs> It's a different situation. I often find that too, because um, I'm with the history and philosophy of science school within the department, within the faculty of science rather at the University of Sydney. But in my research, I kind of bridge the science side of things, the history and philosophy and sociology stuff, and then also law. And it, there's like these three different groups of people who, as you say, think in really different ways. And it's quite interesting to try to bridge that and understand what's going on, on on all of these different levels and then think about how to communicate that. It's a real challenge. And I, I think one of, the, one of the learning points for me has been, you know, came into this, like, oh, we're all academics. We all work in more or less the same ways. Nope, nope. It's, it's very different sort of cultures of work and, and patterns and what have you. And I mean, like the current situation is a perfect example. Um, having to work from home has basically no impact on my research abilities whatsoever. But if you've been banned from the lab and your work is lab dependent, you're going to kind of struggle for the next couple of weeks. <laughs> right. Yeah, I think that that's definitely a problem. Well, I just um, have been going through the process of getting my research ethics approved through my university so that I can actually go out and officially interview people for my sociological research. And um, Unfortunately, my approval came through like just about 20 minutes ago. Um, oh. This has been like <laughs> eagerly awaited for months and months. And, um, and yeah, it's really not great timing because I had hoped that it would come through while I was in Vienna and, you know, I'd have all these people right there, ripe for the interviewing. Yeah. But 
but we're getting better at using technology. Absolutely. So, shall we get on to space law? Absolutely. So the bit that we've chosen of the Outer Space Treaty to discuss, or rather I should say that Thomas has kindly agreed to share his expertise on, is a section of Article 9. Um, and I'm going to read it out and then we will throw to Thomas for his, his take. So the section says, States parties to the treaty shall pursue studies of outer space, including the moon and other celestial bodies, and conduct exploration of them so as to avoid their harmful contamination and also adverse changes in the environment of the Earth, resulting from the introduction of extraterrestrial matter and, where necessary, shall adopt appropriate measures for this purpose. So, Thomas, what does that mean? Yeah, well, that's a really good question. <laughs> and and um, it's sort of unfortunately or fortunately, depending on how you want to approach it, uh, it's not 100% clear. Um, so... In, in practice, how it's been applied and interpreted is what we call planetary protection. And there's there's two sort of angles to what we mean by when we say planetary protection. So there there's forward contamination and backward contamination. So we're worried about sending terrestrial uh, microbes or, or bacteria or what have you to other celestial bodies, particularly if areas of those celestial bodies have the potential to support life. Um, so a practical example is on Mars, uh, the, any area which has the potential for liquid water, uh, and by potential, we do mean a particularly broad interpretation of the term potential, um, because we're, we're being very cautious about how we do this. So for example, when they, they made a discovery about the, the viability of liquid water, on the Martian surface, um, and they therefore had to change the plans for the Mars rover to avoid those areas because it hadn't been sterilized sufficiently uh, to go there. And there's a couple of reasons for these concerns. I mean, one is the sort of Star Trek Prime Directive concern of not wanting to do harm to any potential life that there might be. Uh, but then there's also the scientific concerns about contamination. Um, I.e., if we introduce Earth-based life forms onto Mars, uh, we, we, in the future, when we discover life on Mars, we won't know whether that's actual Martian life or, or whether it was introduced terrestrial life. Um, and go, we found life, but we don't know whether what, what that actually means anything because it might have been off of curiosity, um, which is a problem. And it, the, while the planetary protection guidelines by Coast Guard don't necessarily don't go into things like chemical contamination, um, it is something that has been. Uh, looked at in terms of the, the missions that have been sent because uh, you're all, in science you're always worried about the false positives and I know that there have been concerns about for example with the Viking landers and some of the results it turned up and saying well again is that a genuine result that they got or is that a result of some sort of chemical contamination that was introduced because the Viking wasn't clean enough um, and so there's, there's all sorts of protocols to deal with that mm. uh, then there's what we call backward contamination. And this has been less of an issue predominantly because we actually haven't returned that much stuff to Earth. Um, but the, both NASA and the European Space Agency are currently working on a Mars sample return mission in which this is an issue that does come up. And that is about worrying about bringing any harmful uh, contaminant from outer space to Earth. Um, and, you know, this is probably highlighted most explicitly in the movie, uh, The Andromeda Strain uh, from 1968. Um, in which the astronauts bring back a deadly virus that kills half of the population of, of the Earth. And obviously we don't want that. Um, so we can concerned about that. And it's stuff like that. That's why the Apollo astronauts went into quarantine, um, because there was concern about, well, we don't know what they might be bringing back for the moon. And I've read differing accounts from doctors and biologists and what have you about whether those are realistic fears or not. Um, but, it, you know, it's one of those things where it's probably best to be cautious. Um, part of the problem with the planetary protection guidelines is that they're exactly that, they're, they're guidelines. While we can say that the uh, planetary protection guidelines represent an implementation of Article 9 of the Outer Space Treaty, they actually don't have any binding force and have been established by uh, an international scientific committee. So they're very highly regarded. People um, you know, respect them and try and, gen, and NASA and the European Space Agency and other organizations like that try to implement them. 
Um, but as we've seen with both uh, Elon Musk's launch of his Tesla uh, and the uh, uh, Space IL mission to the moon, um, it's hard to implement these in terms of private actors because there's no legal obligation to do that. Even within the US, it's not part of the licensing process that they have to adhere to them. Um, it's mm. sort of recommended it's good practice. Um, and this, this sort of gets into the point of, like, a lot of people like to say the outer space treaty is outdated. Um, I, I always reject that, that term. Uh, now, without, without going into the like, theory of international law, it's really a there's, the central question here is, is, has the Outer Space Treaty or has space law in general failed to address uh, these concerns or does it simply not address them? Um, and you know, while that might seem like a distinction without a difference, there, there is actually quite a difference there. And I would I fall into the, the Outer Space Treaty simply hasn't considered these because in 1967 it wasn't a concern. And quite frankly, until three years ago, it wasn't a concern at all because private activities weren't being conducted beyond Earth orbit. Um, and even now that private activities are being conducted beyond low Earth orbit, there there aren't that many of them. Um, and then even things like the moon, for example, is considered to be a low risk environment for planetary protection. So it's a question mm -hmm. of how much protection we need. But it is going to be something that becomes increasingly important, especially if we're going to talk about settlements on places like Mars, um, because one of the things that comes out, uh, in fact, the Coast Guard Planetary Protection Guidelines explicitly state this, that human missions to Mars um, basically will require a complete rewriting of the rules because you can't avoid contamination when humans are involved. Um, just mm. simply like waste disposal uh, you know, unless it, it means that you can't avoid uh, that kind of contamination. So you need to come up with a new plan and a different set of rules. Um, and as is so often the case in law, it's really about balancing interests. Um, because you know, if if we're going to develop outer space and and we do need to to well, I mean, there needs to be an element of development if uh, long duration or further scientific missions are going out, even if you don't buy into the whole need to colonize the solar system. You know, we still need more infrastructure so science can be done. Um, then we need commercial activities. It's all going to be public-private partnership. That's how the world works. That's how it's going to be moving forward. Um, so you can't say no SpaceX, you can't do stuff, um, but you also don't want to destroy all the scientific value in the process. Um, and so it's complicated. But then there's, there's also questions about how you conduct science. Um, yeah. And a good, as a good example would be the, the icy moons. And, you know, there are proposals to drill a hole in the ice sheet to see what is in the ocean underneath. And mm. well, that's all sorts of problems there. Um, as, as was seen when they drilled a hole in Lake Vostok, um, and they're pretty sure they've contaminated Lake Vostok now because you the drill. You also bill. know about Lake Vostok? Yeah. It's, <gasps> we must it's... talk further. I did my honors thesis on the scientific project at Lake, Lake Vostok and the cooperation oh, between yeah. the Soviets Excellent. and French and Americans. Brilliant. Brilliant. Um, but yeah, it was kind of like a, a whodunit mystery who contaminated Lake Vostok and, you know, exactly. and the. The, the spoiler alert ending was that we all contaminated it because we were all involved all along or something like that. It was, it was some sort of Latour type thing. But yes, Lake Vostok. So this is this subglacial lake in Antarctica, massive lake. And um, yeah, we're pretty sure that in 2012, when it was penetrated, that it was contaminated, um, which is a big deal because there was thought that this subglacial lake which had been isolated from the rest of the world for a really long time might contain life that would give us a clue to how life might look on Europa or other icy moons um but Europa's kind of like if, if you know I think the interesting thing for me about Lake Vostok was that there was a technological challenge and I went and hung out with some people at JPL who were building the lander that was going to go in to the lake originally before fell apart and Russia did their own thing. But it's interesting to me that the, the failure there, if you want to call it that, was not a technological one, but a social one. It was in the end a sort of breakdown of relationships and trust and kind of cooperation. And I, I think that's really interesting. Um, but then exactly. it makes me think with Europa, it's, it's an even bigger challenge really, isn't it? 
Right. And that's one of the reasons why the, the astrobiology group uh, that I'm part of decided to have a governance person, because that was like the initial sort of thing of like, why does an astrobiology research group need uh, a space lawyer? Um, and it's like exactly these sorts of things, because it's, mm. you know, it's not necessarily a technological failure, but you say we need guidelines and ethical pr uh, procedures in place to ensure that stuff is done in a way that's going to be least harmful. And I've been looking at other sort of ethical guidelines from from other fields. I find uh, the archaeology ethical guidelines to be quite interesting because mm -hmm. archaeologists uh, are quite enthusiastic about this idea of not digging. Um, and they have, you know, they're sort of saying like, they have this principle of you can only dig a site for the first time once. And once you've done a dig, you then have to any future ex, uh, exploration of that site needs to be done in the context of previous archaeological expeditions. So if you're going to dig, you only do it if it's necessary to do so. You've ex exhausted all other non-invasive uh, exploratory procedures and you're certain that your ex excavation methods aren't going to damage the site. Um, and I think that's uh, those are principles that really should be taken into space. Yes, sure, we all want to drill a hole in, in Europa and put a submarine down there to see what's down there. But maybe we should wait 50 years to make sure that the technology that we're using is the best mm -hmm. that, that it can be to ensure the, the pristine nature of the environment. Because after all, its untouchedness is, is a large part of its scientific value. Um, and so we don't want to ruin that. Mm -hmm. and, and it's a challenge, especially because you're trying to court, you know, you know you're trying to coordinate m multiple scientific groups from around the world and that was that was a challenge before 2016 but over the last four years it's only become harder um <laughs> yeah. and i think as as we've seen from the response to the current pandemic um the state of the international order is not good um and even in scientific cooperation uh so it is genuinely a concern um but all we can do is sort of argue for best practices and and I think that maybe um, you know everyone's, the the private sector is a is a potentially a problem, but on the other hand, you know the, the, if we adopt sort of corporate social responsibility approaches to these things, then there may be an avenue that doesn't rely on governments uh, to get the best practices adopted. Um, you know you see that with like the space debris mitigation guidelines, you're getting a number of space companies to say we'll adhere to them even if we're not legally obliged to. Yeah. Um, now, obviously, the problem with that is that they can uh, agree to sign up to the bits that they like rather than accepting all of it, but it's still better than nothing. True, true. I think people often make the assumption that a non-binding guideline is useless, but in international law, I think they've been proven to be quite effective in that they build norms of behavior. And, and as you say, it becomes a thing of like corporate social responsibility or international actor responsibility, where the public really starts to hold these entities to account. And that can be the specific public of sort of the, the space law community. But more broadly, with companies like SpaceX and so on, it becomes a matter of the general public kind of saying, hey, you guys shouldn't be doing that. But it can go wrong. And I was wondering if you could talk us through um, you mentioned the Tesla incident, and you also mentioned the uh, the tardigrades incident. I was wondering if you'd like to talk us through either or both of those and explain what the big deal was and how, kind of how it came about. Absolutely, I think I think I'll, I'll focus on the, the tardigrades and um, yeah. it's, it's fresher in everyone's mind. And um, so there's there's a few issues there um, on on the sort of oh, like legal procedure side of the question um there's a number of questions about what a, you know what are the reporting responsibilities i.e you know because uh, it, it would it would seem that um the fact that there were these tardigrades on the vehicle wasn't disclosed um but it's also not clear that there was an obligation like a legal obligation for them to disclose it either so they may not have broken the law in that sense so that's one of the potential issues. Um, but then there's the question of, well, did there need to be any provisions if, if they weren't? Because you know the concern will have been, oh, you need to tell us what's on the payload. You didn't. But then there's the harmful contamination question. And well, was there any risk? Because under the current planetary protection guidelines, 
the moon is regarded as a low risk environment because effectively it's a, a dead desert. Um, so you don't worry about harmful contamination because there isn't really anything to contaminate. Um, and plus the fact that they say, well, tardigrades are, are hardy. They're not that hardy. And even if they were alive when they crashed onto the surface of the moon, they'll probably be dead by now. Um, so again, what, what worry is there? So for me, it's, it's sort of the procedural thing of the concerns, the procedural thing of, of, well, if this payload wasn't supposed to be there or nobody knew about it, then that's a problem because how do you ensure, you know, do we have to um, physically inspect everything that gets sent into space to make sure that you're telling us the truth? Um, and that's that's a potential problem. I mean, we see that in the maritime sector of, you know, I mean, most cargo containers are not inspected um, and that's why, because you, you can't, there are just so many of them. Um, and that, that's like the number one issue with smuggling. Um, are we gonna have that problem in space? Um, and then there's the question of how do you enforce this? You, know, you see the issue of who's responsible. It was, was it, is, it, is it Israel? Is it the United States? Um, and I, you know, and that, that can be a challenge for missions as well. As you know, you got Article 6 of the Outer Space Treaty, and then, but then there's the launching state involved. And it's not always clear as to who's responsible. And states aren't, aren't usually keen on taking that kind of responsibility. And this is one of the issues that will need to be addressed in the future. Um, and it's, it's, it's not an insurmountable problem. It's just that it needs to be the will to like sit down and decide, right? So the launching state must do X, Y, and Z. Um, um, you know, and but then there's then there's there's a broader question as well as to what are we doing with the moon or any of the celestial bodies? Because there are numerous proposals for things, and you sit back and go, really? I I, I saw one um, not too long ago, and it was about uh, I'll send your ashes to the moon or a portion of your ashes to the moon. And there, there is this kind of, I don't know whether you want to say cultural question as to whether we really want the moon to become some sort of dumping ground for any wackers, any idea from anyone who's got the money to do it. Um, and I think that was the issue with Musk's Tesla. Um, you know, it, it's like, yeah, okay, he can fire his car into outer space if he wants to, but should he, um, you know, should we allow space to become uh, the, you know, a playground for the, the, the wealthy to do with it as they wish? Um, or are there, quite, you know, are there sort of how do we treat it? Um, do we have a, a more sort of social moral obligation to um, think about what we're doing? And it's like, oh, question of, yeah, just because you can doesn't mean you should. Um, mm. But again, I, I, I don't know if that's a legal thing. And I think that's more of a sort of a moral social question. Because um, I don't know that you can, I mean, obviously you, you could put a ban on activities, but I don't think it's, it's a legal responsibility to like, you know, create guidelines. This is what you can do. This is what you can't do. I think it's more of a cultural, social question as to, well, what do we want to do with space? Yeah, I think you're right. There's this real intersection between the hard law and then the kind of soft ethics or principles kind of thing. And with the Outer Space Treaty, something I think that's quite powerful about it, but that in my conversations with various space lawyers over the last few days and I guess over the next week or so as I'm recording these conversations will come up is this idea of, well, is this is it good law? Is it outdated? Is it useful? Or is it a set of guiding principles? Is it a philosophy? What What is the Outer Space Treaty? And I think what's coming out of this discussion is that, like, and, and correct me if I'm wrong, but it sounds as though what we're discussing here is the Outer Space Treaty sets up some really useful principles and sort of guidelines as to how we ought to think about our activity. And then we need to have more specific guidelines, non-binding or binding, and domestic law that enacts that in order for it to be effective. So in some ways saying, well, the Outer Space Treaty is ineffective because it didn't stop tardigrades being put on the moon is kind of a null point. It doesn't really get to the, the crux of the issue. Would you agree with that? Absolutely. And I, I always like to point out that the full title of the Outer Space Treaty is a treaty on principles uh, on activities in outer space. 
And so in, in the name, it indicates that it's about principles. It's not about creating, you know, it's not the United Nations Convention on the Law of the Sea. It's not a comprehensive, uh, you know, fully codification, full codification of law for outer space. It's a foundational framework that is meant to be developed and expanded. Um, but there's also a further point that sort of, again, not going to get into the legal theory behind it, sure. but like, law only really works if people buy into it, if people have sort of uh, a, a connection to it, feel it as a legitimacy. So, you know, yeah, we could we could write all the new laws we want. We could we could write new treaties. But if the space community doesn't accept the, the principles behind these new laws, then they're not going to work. Um, you know, so yeah, we can say we're going to ban all future tardigrade type activities. Um, but if people are like, well, we want to do it, or we don't, we don't buy into the the you know theory thinking behind these new laws, then they're they're simply not going to work, and they'll be ignored. Um, mm -hmm. So it's it's law by itself is never a solution. Right. Look, I think this has been a fabulous discussion and I hope you've enjoyed it as much as I have. I'm so thrilled to find a fellow Lake Vostok fan, if we can use that terminology. Um, Absolutely. It's a delight and, you know, I'm so pleased. I mean, a pandemic is dreadful, but the fact that it's meant that <laughs> I have found you across the world is great. Absolutely. Is there anything that you would want our viewers or listeners, if this goes in audio form as well, to go and Google, read, um, think about, look up, listen to over the next few weeks or in general? Mm, that's a good question. I think, I think just um, read in general, read, read, read broadly, read, you know, there's some excellent books on space history out there. Um, I think one of my favorites is uh, the, the Heavens and the Earth by Walter McDougall. Um, which is a nice thick uh, political history of the space age, um, but then there are other books like uh, Dr. Gorman's uh, Space Doctor Space Junk versus the Universe, which provides an excellent overview of, of many of these issues that we, we've talked about. Um, but then also, you know, read non-space books as well. Um, you know, read read the history of European colonialism and the origins of uh, Western science, and think about you know politics and philosophy. Um, you know, space isn't a you know space itself might be a vacuum, but uh, human activities in outer space don't operate in a vacuum, and it's it's will will take all of our baggage from Earth into outer space. And so we need to understand what that baggage is. Mm. Agreed. Thank you so much, Thomas. It has been great to talk to you. Thank you. Absolutely.